If there was one word that could describe the story of your life, what would that one word be? That's a question that was put to me and I want to give the answer. And I want to look deeper into the answer in God's word this morning so that we can have a faith for living. This is Faith for Living with Dr. Michael Milton, an outreach of Reformed Theological Seminary. Today, Dr. Milton brings the second part of the message, The Grand Narrative. Here now is Dr. Michael Milton. Sociologists, people like the late Neil Postman, as well as Christian professors like Marva Dawn, tell us that the horrors of the 20th century, the Holocaust, communism, two world wars, have caused many people to question the old frameworks that we had and to begin to question the deeper things of life. How, how is it that we could have in the 20th century uh, two world wars, uh, this, this great uh, murder of a people, uh, uh, the, the final solution, as it were, by a madman? How could a country allow a madman to arise? So many questions. Communism uh, brutalizing and killing millions of people. And the great existential questions of life were not answered always by Christians. And as a result, a society began to drift away, say the sociologists and now are trying to find meaning as we move into the 21st century to the great questions of life. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? What if someone asks you, what is the one word to describe your life? What would you say? Well, I was going into seminary, and I was applying for a scholarship at the seminary not the seminary I ended up graduating from, but one I started in. And I was sitting in front of this committee and someone on the committee asked me that question. They said, Mr. Milton, what would you say about your life? How, how would you describe your life in one word? Well, I thought that was an interesting question and I had an answer immediately, an answer that came to me. Now, the one who asked, you have to understand, was professor of religion and psychology. What, uh, Mr. Milton, would be the, uh, the one word <laughs> to describe your life? I'm very interested to see about it. Maybe that is, <laughs> you know. And I said, dependence. Oh, well, that's a, that scared him to death. Dependence! Oh, I see we've got a real sicko here. I could see his, his, his mind, the cogitation uh, of his mind uh, grinding. And he said, uh, dependence, Mr. Milton? And I could see there he went my scholarship right out the window. <laughs> he said, so you're a, a dependent person, is that right? I said, yes. I said, I used to be independent. But then I learned that I was a sinner in need of a Savior. And I learned that I was dependent upon Jesus Christ to save me. And then I began to follow him, and I learned that I didn't have the power in and of myself to, to follow him, that I was dependent on him even to love and to follow him. I said, I am the most dependent person. He said, I see. Very well. well, we'll have to meet and reconsider the scholarship. Well, I got the scholarship, but I ended up leaving because of the way they answered their question themselves. And their quest, the answer to their question was not, we're depending upon Jesus, but we're depending upon religion and philosophy and psychology. And I stayed there just long enough to get fed up with it and I left a 100% ride scholarship to go uh, work my way through seminary where I had no scholarship. But it was worth it all 
Because the answer I got at that seminary was, we're dependent. That's the theology I live with. That's the story of my life. What's the story of your life? How would you name it? In the Bible, it certainly is dependent. Because as we read previously in Exodus, Moses had to say that the events in my life are completely out of my control. And then he grows up, he realizes that he has a Hebrew lineage, although he's now into an Egyptian parentage, and he's living in an Egyptian court, and he takes matters into his own hands. And that leads him to killing an Egyptian, and he's exiled because of that. And then God comes to him in a burning bush. Extraordinary part of Moses' story, a supernatural intervention. No less extraordinary than the way God comes to you today through the power of his Holy Spirit speaking through his word, always alive, always burning and never consumed. He speaks to Moses and call, calls Moses to become someone that Moses was previously not, a spokesman for God, someone who would deliver a word from another world, someone who would do things God's way rather than Moses' way. The people of Israel would be liberated from the Egyptian bondage not because of Moses' intervention, because of his strength, as an influence as an Egyptian prince. No. Uh, he would come as a shepherd from the wilderness, one with a closet filled with skeletons. And he would come to a people that didn't trust him, his own people, the Hebrews, and he would come to the court of Pharaoh that didn't trust him. And you could also say, as he was coming to the Egyptian, he was coming to his people. Nobody liked him. Everyone had questions about him. And he had a lot of questions about himself. He was absolutely dependent upon God. And what happened was that Moses' story was swept into the story of redemption that is running all through the Bible. What happened with Moses' story is the people who were following God through Moses, their lives got swept up into this redemptive story as they begin to move forward. And the rest of the story unfolds that the people sin as they go through the wilderness. And then it is another generation without Moses, with Joshua, that takes the land that was promised to Abraham. A people had been pro promised. A land had been promised, but there was a promise that was even greater than that. For in Joshua, we learned that they, they took every inch of ground that was promised by God, but they lost it because of their sin. So we say, well, the story is over. It was, it was finished. No, no. Again, we see the story is dependent upon the author of the story not upon the players or the bit players. And so the story will continue. It'll continue through disobedience and judges. It will continue then through faithfulness with a Moabitess woman named Ruth. The story will continue. The book of Esther as the Jewish people, the people of God who were going to bring forth Messiah, are to be snuffed out. There was a final solution by Haman, who spoke into the ear of the king. You've got to get rid of these people. How many times has, has that phrase been whispered into the ear of king? You need to get rid of these people. They're rebellious. They're worshiping another god. They really... they. You've got to get rid of them, and I, I can take care of it for you. And so in that story, the one who made that suggestion 
ends up being killed on the gallows that he had prepared for a Jew. And Israel is saved by a woman named Esther. And so the story goes forward. Repeatedly throughout the Old Testament, preparing for the new, the story goes forward all the way to the birth of Jesus. And then it, the same cycle begins over again. Jesus is born and the psychopathic governor, Herod, tries to kill all the baby boys. Where have we heard that before? The Moses story all over again. But God works through pagan princes who had come to pay homage to the king of kings, for they recognized the birth of Jesus as the birth of God, of their Lord and Savior. And through their intervention and through the angel of the Lord speaking directly to the earthly father, the adoptive father of Jesus, Joseph, they were led to safety. Where? just like Joseph, back to Egypt. The story repeats itself. And then finally, Jesus grows up, as we know, in Nazareth. But then the story starts again. The same story now is recycled again in his adult life. As faith begins to break forward with this God-man, raising people from the dead, healing people, opening blind eyes and opening deaf ears, bringing reconciliation and peace, calling for people to repent for the kingdom of God had come, identifying himself as God. As faith begins to spread and people's lives are changed, the one who is called the dragon in the book of Revelation, begins to rise up again and seek to destroy God's story of redemption, this time by destroying the mediator of that redemption, the, the prince of heaven, Jesus himself, on the cross. And so, again, it looks like the story is going to end, as it always does. It always looks like it's, it's over. King of kings and Lord of lords is being crucified by those he had created. He goes into a tomb and is laid on a cold stone slab. There God resides in a tomb on Black Saturday. And it looks like the story's over. But you and I know the story's not over. For well, that body was reanimated through the power of the Spirit of God. And Jesus Christ was raised again from the dead. I tell my son sometimes, I say, do you realize there's one who died, but he's now alive, and he's in the body he was in before. It's in an eternal state now, but it's the same body. It's been reanimated. It's been resurrected. Do you realize that there is a locus, a, a, a place for this body somewhere in the world, somewhere in reality, beyond this world? Yes, but there exists a real body, and that body is going to come again in the sky, and every eye is going to see him. Do you realize that? That changes everything that gives hope to the hopeless, sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf. The story of stories. And now that story comes to you. And what I would say to you is the story tends to repeat itself in each of our lives. Faith arises out of a hardship and a brokenness. The devil seeks to stop, snuff out 
that faith, but Christ is always victorious and leads you through every hardship and every trial to cause you to be victorious through, according to Romans 8, the very things which came against you were more than conquerors through these things, persecution and hardship and so forth. And that's the cycle that happens all through the Bible. That's the story. So to be caught up in that story, which always ends in victory, one has to begin with faith. Repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And I want to ask you even right now, if you have expressed that to God, or is your story independent of His story? Or do you think your story can outlast His story? You say, I'm an independent man. I'm an independent woman. I don't want to be part of his story. I've got my own story. I'm living. Maybe that would have been your answer to the scholarship committee. How do you sum up your life? Absolutely independent. Oh, tell us about it. That would have made him very happy, by the way. Well, you see, I developed a religion some time ago, and uh, I followed my religion, and uh, I feel pretty good about myself, pretty good about the world, and uh, yes, I've got questions that are unanswered, but. Uh, We'll leave them unanswered, and, and I'm doing the best I can, and, uh, you know, that, that's just who I am. You know, uh, love it or leave it. Well, we love it. That's just, that's great. An independent life? Oh, that's wonderful. How will this story end? Well, I, I'm going to die, I guess. What, what would happen then? Well, I'm not sure. I believe that it's possible I could be caught up in the universal. What does that mean? I, I don't know, really, but I read it somewhere in a spirituality book, somewhere in Barnes & Noble. I'm just going to be caught up in everything, and I'll become part of everything. Ah. Of course, that may not happen. It may be that I just turn to, turn to dust. And this life is all there is. Come to think of it, that's, that's not a very happy thought. But uh, on to uh, my story. Uh, in an independent life, maybe that's what you're saying. How different that is from the life of dependency upon Jesus Christ, who turns your pain into praise, who enters your story when you say, Lord, I repent, and I turn to you, and I'm absolutely dependent upon you, Lord Jesus Christ. When that happens, your story is no longer your story. It's God's story at work in you. It's the very story of the gospel, the story of Jesus now alive in you. So that everything is now working, even the hardships and the trials and the brokenness, everything is now working toward an end, a glorious end, where you will have answers to those questions. Where are you going to go when you die? When I die, according to the Bible, according, if Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, as I believe he is, then According to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he's the first fruits of others who believe. Therefore, I'm going to be raised from the dead. When I die, my, the, the real part of me, my soul, is going to be with God. But God doesn't forget my body. One day, Christ is coming again, and my very body, like Jesus's, will be reanimated. And body and soul, I'll be able to serve him forever. Will you live on a cloud and play a harp? I've always wanted to play a harp. I don't think I'll live on a cloud, though, because God speaks of a new heaven and a new earth. You see, the story began in Eden, and in Revelation, the story ends in a new Eden, a new heaven and a new earth. And all of the beauty and the glory and the hope and the promise of Eden is restored. To quote my great uncle John Milton, it's paradise restored. Paradise was lost, but the last part of the story, the second book, the one most people don't read, is paradise is 
restored, regained. So your life has meaning. My life has meaning because Christ has meaning in my life. And you won't turn to dust? Yes, maybe I will, but my body is going to be reanimated. As the Puritans say, if, God, if the farmer knows where the corn is in the barn, God knows where his seed is in the ground. So God's going to take care of me, body and soul. What is your purpose in life? To glorify God. You mean that makes you happy? Yes. So you just sit around singing hymns all day? No. I glorify God, as C.S. Lewis said, when I'm puttering about in the garden. I glorify God when I'm having a good conversation with a friend. I glorify God in my eating, in my drinking. I glorify God. How is it that you glorify God? Because I'm in Christ. Because I'm in Christ. In every part of my story, all of the parts of my story are now in his story. And you're happy? Yes. And you no longer have pain or tribulation or hardship? That's not so. He's just always there in the pain and tribulation and the hardship. How do I have this? The same way I received it and every believer throughout history received it. We receive Him by faith. Not a faith which is a temporary faith, a temporal faith which says, I better believe in God or else I better believe in God or so this plane hopefully will, will come down that's hitting a bunch of bumps in the air. Yes, God, I believe in you. No, that's not the kind of faith. Is saving faith. That's I call that an emergency faith. He'll accept that if it's genuine. But the faith in the Bible that is saving faith is a transfer of trust from yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ as the living and resurrected Savior. That's the trust. There is a repentance component in that in which you turn away from depending upon everything else and depend solely on Christ. That is what Moses had to do in the passage we read from Exodus. Moses had a vision to free the people of Israel, but he did it his way. He was dependent upon his influence as a member of the court of Egypt. What he had to learn in 40 years in the back 40 of the Midian desert before burning bush was I have to be dependent upon you and God, you have a vision that's greater than my vision. Your ways are not my, my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. They're higher. They're better. And so Moses' story had to stop, had to be over. And a new story had to begin in which the Lord lived on the throne of Moses' life. And Moses had to realize that everything that had happened in his past, God was in control of that, just the way you have to recognize that. Just the way you have to recognize that everything that has gone on in your life, God has been there with the hard parts and the good parts to lead you to the place where you will take off your shoes, as it were, and recognize that you're standing on holy ground as the Word of God comes to you that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That story has come to you now.
How would you describe your life? Independent? Much better to be dependent. Dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ. To do that is to come into his story, which always ends in victory, in joy, in a new heaven and a new earth, and hope and meaning for your life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dr. Milton, in light of what you said about believers being dependent on Christ, could you also elaborate on how believers should be dependent on other believers within the body of Christ? And this might touch on the subject matter of your new book, Friendly Fire. Yes, uh, that's an excellent question. We are dependent upon Christ, but He has ordained it so that we're dependent upon each other. We need each other. For instance, there is no way for me to understand forgiveness unless I'm in a relationship with you and you possibly hurt my feelings, or vice versa. So we begin to learn how to live the Christian life in the context of living with one another. And uh, church in the Greek in, in the, uh, means the assembly. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew means the, the, gathered, uh, the gathered one, the congregation. So it's always been that when we are called by God into a relationship with Him, we are placed in a, a local body of believers. And there we learn uh, the virtues that, that God wants us to learn. So we are dependent upon each other for prayer, for support, for encouragement, for discipline, uh, for speaking a loving word, Yes, we're, we're dependent upon God and each other. We invite you to write in to the address that you see on the bottom of the screen or, or call the telephone number you see on the bottom of the screen and get a free copy of a book I've written called Hit by Friendly Fire, What to Do When Other Believers Hurt You. We believe that this will be of ministry to many in the body of Christ. So write in for your free copy of Hit by friendly fire. God bless you. If you'd like to know more about Dr. Milton and the ministry of Reformed Theological Seminary, visit our website at faithforliving.net. Also, Dr. Milton recently wrote a book called Songs in the Night, focusing on how the gospel can transform our pain into praise. Today, we're offering a free chapter taken from that book called Theology of Thorns. If you'd like to receive your free booklet, call us at 1-800-390-7426 and ask for offer number 11-11.